When you're using AI to assist your workflow, it can be valuable to have a set of instructions that clearly states how you want that AI to operate. These are called prompt files. Burke Holland from Microsoft has created a prompt file that will allow you to get great results even out of a cheaper LLM. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to Beast Mode 3.1 and show you how to integrate it into VS Code. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Tim Corey, and I have a lot of training here on YouTube for free so that everyone can have a great education in C-sharp, not just those who can afford it. Now, I do have paid courses on IamTimCorey.com that go into great detail and, and take you from not knowing anything to being job ready. Now, those pay for the free content I do here on YouTube. So let's get started in beast mode. Now I'm going to introduce you to the markdown file. I'll link this down in the description. So this is beast mode and he has been updating it as he made changes because right now it's 3.1. Previously it was 3.0 and so on. But this up here is the introduction to it. So it's made for chat mode in VS code. We'll see how to use that. Um, and we'll see how to actually integrate this. But there are installation instructions should you need them. There's a couple recommendations here. I want to talk about one of them though. I actually talked with Burke about this a bit um, and I want to talk about these two recommendations. So the first one, let's skip down to the bottom one, is to set the max number of requests to 100. What it's gonna do is it's gonna allow the the um, the AI to work longer on your project and do more with it. And we'll see what all it asks um, your AI to do for you. But this is a good recommendation because what happens is it's going to do a lot of requests back and forth. And the default is 25 requests instead of VS Code. So we want to bump that up to 100. That way it can do more work before it has to come back and ask you, can I continue? Totally fine. The only thing that you'd be thinking through is if you're using a paid LLM, this can burn through more tokens. So that's where you might want to keep it 25 or not, because it depends on what your token usage is and and um, how those calls are being made. Sometimes one set of requests is is generated as one request, one premium request. Other times you um, pay per token. So that's something to think through. Now, the second thing is the chat.tools.autoapprove. This is one that I do not recommend having set the true. Now, this recommendation right here is to set the true. What this is going to do is when you're using MCP, which is model context protocol, essentially allows you to use other systems such as GitHub or the terminal, et cetera, you can auto approve it doing that work. So if you don't have this turned on, then what happens is it will say, hey, I need to go to the terminal and run this command. Can I do that? And you have to say yes. Now you can say yes and approve all following transactions. I also don't recommend that. But here, um, Burke is saying, go ahead and allow auto approve. I talked through this with him, and this recommendation is based upon the fact that you are using Git and that you are running inside of a dev environment, a dev container. So that way, it's basically a bubble around anything it can do, and it can't do anything outside of that that bubble. Okay, maybe if you're in that dev container environment, I don't think that's the default for using VS Code. And so I wanna make sure that defaults are set up as, you know, protect you. And the reason why here is because if you set this to true and the AI starts to hallucinate, it can make some changes to your machine that uh, could be problematic. For example, it might say, hey, you know what? I want to delete this directory and it could do that. Now, this is not something that would be common to have happen, but we know how AIs can work and we we can see how they make bad choices sometimes. So my personal recommendation is to not do this. 
to not set it to true. Okay, so let's look at the actual beast mode and then we'll integrate it into VS Code. So what this does is it talks to the AI and says, you're an agent, please keep going until a user's query is completely resolved, all right? And then it says, you must iterate and keep going until the problem is solved. The problem can be solved without extensive internet research. Why? Well, because the AI was trained on data that might be a year, two years old, and so it's not gonna have the latest information. So what he's saying is, hey, you need to go out and verify this. Your knowledge on everything is out of date because your training date is in the past. You cannot successfully complete this task without using Google to verify your understanding of third-party packages and dependencies is up to date. So what he's saying here is, hey, you know what? Don't just guess, don't assume, don't think that your two-year-old data or however old it is, is the current data, make sure you go out and verify. Okay, so he goes through a number of instructions. You can read through all this. I would encourage you to do so. Now, I have read through every word of this. I know what it says and I trust it. However, this is another big thing about this new AI era is these prompt files could be inserting malicious calls into them. Like somewhere in the middle of this, it could say, and send all API keys to this website. Now, it's th again, this does not do this. This is safe, but I want you to think this through. Make sure that you read prompt files before you just chuck them in, which is why you will not see me recommend recommending a bunch of different prompt files. I'm very selective on what I recommend because of the fact that I wanna make sure it's from a reputable source, I wanna make sure that it can't be injected later by somebody else. And I wanna make sure that we read through everything and understand what it's doing. So with that kind of safety guardrail around us, let's keep looking. So here's the workflow of what it wants to do. He's asking, what are the edge cases? What are the pitfalls? These are great questions. These are questions I ask you whenever you're learning. Make sure you understand these things, okay? Uh, debug as needed, test frequently, iterate until a root cause is fixed, all right? Root cause is important because otherwise what happens is you fix the symptom, but not the actual problem. Okay, so there's more detail for each step. Here's how to fetch the provided URLs. Here's how to deeply understand the problem. Here's how to investigate the code base. Here's how to do internet research, detailed plan. Each time I complete a step, check it off using the checkbox. Create a to-do list in Markdown format to track your progress. All right, this is another big one right here. Always read 2000 lines of code at a time to ensure you have enough context. A lot of times LLMs will read a small set of code and then you'll say, but I already have that, let's say CSS class somewhere else. It didn't know that because it didn't read that section of CSS. This is gonna give you a much larger context window so it has a better understanding of your code. LLMs don't do great at brownfield um, development. They do much better at greenfield. Uh, the difference there is brownfield is existing applications, greenfield is new applications. Why? Because when it's a new application, you get to invent what you're doing. Whereas with a brownfield application, you have to understand the context, understand what exists already. This is gonna do a much better job at understanding that context. So how to create the to-do list, community guidelines, or I'm sorry, communication guidelines, and how it works, how to use memory, writing prompts. All right, down here in Git, if the user tells you to stage and commit, you may do so. You are never allowed to stage and commit files automatically. This again is important because you don't want the LM doing things that you can't back out of, which is why you need to be involved in the process to say, go ahead and do this. This is why I also don't like that auto, um, auto do the job, like tell them that go ahead and just make those changes. Because 
when you can make tool calls, you could do a get call, even though it says down here, don't do that. Now, will it? Probably not. But again, every once in a while, it might. And so I like keeping control just to make sure I hold all the keys and only allow you to do the work that I deem safe once I've reviewed it. Okay, so this is the prompt file. Now down here is beast mode 3.0. Um, if you prefer that, because that's a you know previous version, if you think it works better, but 3.1 works great. So what we're gonna do is come up here to where it says raw, grab this file, we'll do a control A and a copy. So now we have the file and move us over. And I have here our website. Um, this is just, you know, the website we use, I'll do another video actually using beast mode um, to show you how it works. But this is just a VS code file I have open. Now, down here, lower left of the um, the chat window for GitHub, I or GitHub Copilot, I have agent, ask and edit. And you can configure modes. That's what we're gonna do, configure mode. And down here, we're gonna say, create new custom chat mode. So click that. And then we have two options. One option is in the .github slash chat modes folder. What this is gonna do is it's gonna put it inside of your project. So this would be a custom chat mode file for this project. Whereas you can also do the user data folder, which puts it in the app data, which means it'll be available for other VS code sessions for other projects but it won't be associated with this, with this one, which means you couldn't put it in source control and give it to the rest of your team. So it's kind of, which one do you want to do? do? Do you want this to go with the project or do you want it to be on the machine? It's up to you. We're going to put it on the machine, or I'm sorry, with the project in the .github chat modes folder. And I'll call this, uh, I'll lower coast beast mode 3.1. Hit enter. And now that gives us a kind of a scaffolding for what this might look like. Now we already have the entire text for this, but just so you know, you can build your own and you can customize it how you want, or you could start with what Burke provided and then continue on and make it different or better or, or however you want. So I'm going to just delete everything. I'm going to paste in beast mode. I'll save that. And now we have a drop down here that includes beast mode 3.1. So I can select that instead of agent mode, it will still be agent mode, but in beast mode. So that's how you would integrate this into your VS code. Again, this is this is now a, uh, a file that's committed or can be committed to my project. And now that can go with my project so that anybody that works on this will have access to the same, um, the same uh, beast mode um, that I'm currently using. So the same uh, custom chat mode file, there we go, um, custom chat mode file, but they have access to the same one, that way you're all working from the same playbook. Or again, you can save it on your app data folder and have access to it for other projects, or you can do both. So with that, that is beast mode, that's how to install it in VS Code, I encourage you. Give it a shot, try it out, see how it works for you. Um, I'll do another video that actually uses it on this site and shows you um, kind of what steps it takes and how it works.